I'm Sam Roberts of the New York Times, and welcome to the New York Times Close Up. Times op-ed columnist Nick Kristof has been our Marco Polo, going where lots of us don't dare. He writes eloquently about the world's injustices and prods us to be mindful global citizens. He tells us about his most recent trip in a moment. Our Times colleagues discuss the events of the week on The Backstory, and I'll have some additional thoughts on CODA. But first, op-ed columnist Nick Kristof. His most recent trip was to the Central African Republic. He was joined by photographer Lindsay Adario and the winner of Nick's annual Win a Trip journey, Tyler Pager of Northwestern and Oxford Universities. Nick, how did uh, Tyler qualify for that trip, and how did he react to going with a real live Times reporter on a journey to a relatively exotic place? Well, the backdrop for this Win a Trip contest is that back when I was covering Darfur, I was trying to figure out a way of ginning up a little more student interest in the issue. And I came up with the idea of taking a student with me to Darfur. So I suggested this internally in the New York Times. And the lawyers came back and said, so you want to take a student to a war zone? <laughs> OK, so that, that was dead. So then I reconceived it as a trip to take a student with me on a look at global poverty or inequity. And uh, students supply by writing an essay. And then I, I look for somebody who can basically communicate to other students to try to arouse interest among young people in these issues that I really care very deeply about. And Tyler was, um, actually every student I've traveled with has been a has been a, a great success. I mean, they get bitten by malarial mosquitoes and spend enormous hours bouncing over the world's worst roads uh, and um, eating some of the world's worst food. And they, I think they really, you know, when you see these issues in front of you and you see kids dying of malaria for one of a $5 bed net, it, it, it just, it changes you. And it's I'll been exciting it to see that change. We'll look at some photographs from that trip. But how do you convey that? Obviously, you do that uh, through the column. But how do you convey those real life experiences uh, to all the other people in addition to the one you take along? Uh, is there a way? It, does video do it? Does the column do it? Uh, how do you uh, replicate that experience to so many other people? I'm a great believer in in images and video. And so that's why on this trip we took Lindsay Adaria, one of the world's greatest photographers. Uh, in the past I've often take a, taken a video journalist. I'm, and that is now something we could do through nytimes.com that we that's right. could not do in the paper for the most part. That's right. We're all kind of merging newspapers, TV, uh, web organizations. I was also really shaped when I was uh, covering Darfur. I was just very frustrated by making these trips and writing these stories and it just felt like they were disappearing without a ripple. And I came across the work of a social psychologist named Paul Slovic who studies what makes people care, what makes people connect. And he found through various experiments that it's about largely about individual stories. And so I've really taken that to heart and I, I very often will try to tell the story of one particular family, one particular child, one particular something. Reducing it to a microcosm. If exactly. That I think it's really hard to get Americans to care about 60 million kids who should be in school but aren't. I think that telling the story of one bright, ambitious child who desperately wants to go to school and can't for one of a few dollars, I think that, that moves people. And once you once you've lured them in, then hopefully they can get engaged in the broader struggle and not just the effort involving that one child. When you look back at the Holocaust or the uh, Cambodian genocide, we say, how could we have missed it? How could we not have done anything? And yet there are somewhat similar, maybe smaller scale things going on today. Why don't we care? Or and why don't we do anything? Well, Historically, unfortunately, the common pattern has been that we don't do very much, whether the Armenian genocide or the Holocaust or, as you say, Cambodia, Rwanda. Uh, during Rwanda, there wasn't, during the Rwandan genocide in 1994, there wasn't a single 
op-ed column about the genocide as it was unfolding. Hmm. Um, in the Times? In or? the New York Times. Hmm. In the New York Times. I mean, we dropped the ball. And um, we criticized government officials for dropping the ball. The Clinton administration certainly did. But we do the same thing. And one of my concerns now is that the Trump administration is kind of oblivious to foreign affairs, and we rightly criticize them for for that, especially these humanitarian issues. But we in the media are kind of guilty of that too, that Trump sucks out all the oxygen in the room and makes it harder to get attention, especially on TV for these issues. The Rohingya, the genocide, what I believe is the Rohingya, is genocide against the Rohingya in, in Myanmar is unfolding. And um, it is kind of horrifying that this is proceeding and that you know, you watch cable television and you're basically, you don't see anything about it at all. I think we will, we in the media will look back at that with regret and I think a certain degree of shame. Obviously, there's a great deal to write about when it comes to Trump and a lot that we can criticize, but do we pile on too much? Is it Trump, Trump, Trump? And is there a Trump fatigue on the part even of Times readers? So when I look at the metrics of columns that I do, um, that fatigue has not set in, and I... You are one of the few. Uh, but I must say, I mean, I... So I try to bounce back and... I mean, it does seem to me that really fundamentally the most important thing going on in the world today probably is the Trump administration issues related to... This really is an important historical moment. But there are other historically important things going on as well, like the... The, the genocide against the Rohingya. And so I try to bounce back and forth, and that's why I made this trip to Central African Republic. You know, this year there are five million kids who will die before the age of five. We can't forget about that issue just because we have President Trump in the, in the White House. And I think we in the media have to figure out a better way of, on the one hand, covering these enormously important issues unfolding in Washington relating to our constitution, issues of war and peace, uh, to domestic inequity, and yet still continue to cover enormously important things happening elsewhere in the world. Syria has, you know, largely dropped off the radar screen, and um, we can't let that happen. And as you reported the other day, we've now been in Iraq for 15 years and uh, now sort of take it for granted. What have you learned from the kids that you've taken along on these trips? They bring fresh eyes, which I will never again have. Uh, and I think that sometimes there is a danger of uh, correspondents, foreign correspondents, or people, you know, old hack columnists. Uh, and we, we think, well, that's not new. And it is kind of useful to go with a student who's seeing these things for the first time and is seeing, you know, kids not able to go to school uh, for one of tiny amounts of money, or dying of malaria, or dying of diarrhea, uh, or suffering mental disability because they, they don't get iodized salt. And it's, a, you know, one of our, uh, our former executive editors, Max Frankel, at the Times, used to say that some of the most important things don't happen on any one day. They happen every day. And so these students remind me that we have to also make sure we cover these things that happen every day and provide that backdrop to our readers as well. As you said, one of the things we have to balance is giving attention to an issue but not harping on it. You wrote recently about uh, the metrics of some of your worst columns. Defining worst is those that got the least bit of the readership. Read. Is that a fair metric? I mean, shouldn't we be writing what we think is important or what we're covering that we think readers ought to know rather than necessarily what they are finding to read, particularly on the web when so much is a, uh, a factor of where those stories are placed. And the, uh, and the metrics become self-fulfilling. So I think uh, a couple of things. I do think that 
we need to be um, concerned with metrics for a couple of reasons. Uh, we need a business model, and so we need to figure out how to pay for my trips to cover the Rohingya or my trips to Central Africa. So we need some stories that, that will bring in the revenue to pay for those trips. And also, I must say that, I mean, within the Times, as you know, there's been some debate about these metrics. And my view has been that we should use them, look at them to understand how to engage readers. And, you know, if, if we write about some Hollywood starlet, then it's going to do well, <laughs> whatever we do. But writing about genocide in Myanmar, if I can understand a little bit better how I can get 10% more viewers to that, maybe because, maybe if I use a video, or maybe because I change the headline, or uh, because I use some other some other device, then that really matters. And so I, um, I embrace the metrics as a way of leveraging these issues that I really care about. Do I worry a little bit that we will become addicted to just feeding what the audience wants and drop coverage of Syria, genocide in Myanmar, whatever? You know, I... I, I do worry a little bit that I think in television that has already happened and uh, there isn't a clear business model for a lot of the foreign news. So it has to be a sense of responsibility that this is important, that we, we in journalism, we claim certain special privileges because of our role in society and we have to live up to those expectations and our audience and the public. Likewise, it's, they should hold our feet to the fire and make sure we do that. Nick, a quick uh, trick question with a one-word answer, if you can. Trump coming up, resign, reelected, impeached, indicted. Um, I would say none of the above. I think he will serve out his term, uh, and I don't think he will be indicted while in office. I don't think he will be reelected. Um, so I would, I, my guess is that he will finish his term, but he will be defeated. Okay, Nick Kristoff of the New York Times. You could read his columns, of course, on the op-ed page, The Sunday Review, and anytime online at nytimes.com, and also subscribe to his newsletter. My Times colleagues, join me for the backstory next. Welcome back, and what kind of week has it been? What can we dare to anticipate in the week ahead? It was, again, a week of uncertainty in Washington. In Albany, Democratic Party primary challenger Cynthia Nixon ratcheting up her attacks on Governor Cuomo. Mayor de Blasio's campaign finances continue to be under scrutiny. Joining me to discuss these issues and more, my Times colleagues, contributing writer Eleanor Randolph, Metro political correspondent Shane Goldmacher, and City Hall Bureau reporter William Newman. So it takes a arrest of a reporter in the state legislature <laughs> to get the governor to answer questions these days. <laughs> really, uh, what's that all about? You know, who knows? I mean, look, they're, they've got a few hours before this uh, budget, you know, has to be signed off on. Uh, they, it's got to be ready by uh, April 1st, which is crazy. I mean, um, somebody said that uh, they should worry about the bottom line and not the deadline. And I, I think that's really right. But, but, the, but Governor Cuomo really wants this budget to be on time. And he, and he really cares about that. And as we were saying earlier, that sort of cuts down on his leverage. Uh, but uh, what they've done is they, it's the same old, same old. They all, instead of three men, you know, in a room, they're now four men in a room. And um, they're, they're, they're sort of, um, sort of crossing out things and changing things. And, and when the budget actually gets to the legislature, it will literally be hot the paper will be warm from the printers. And of course, no one will have read it. Oh, of course And this not. last minute wrinkle of injecting uh, this special Penn Station zoning area, which is consistent with the governor's new version of congestion pricing, where is that going and what's the point? I don't know, it looked to me like a provocation and nothing more and his constant, you know, looking for ways to needle 
the mayor. Um, <laughs> the thing was pretty extreme. It basically carves out this area around Penn Station and says that all city zoning, all city laws and rules no longer apply here. And the and state... And all city taxes. Right. And the state way. essentially That's gets to do whatever it wants so they can put up the biggest buildings possible. Vornado, I'm sure, was pleased because they own most of the real estate around Penn Station. Now, is that comparable to what was done, at least originally, with the Times Square District? Uh, when that was being uh, revised ages ago, I guess under the Koch administration or maybe even before? That's a great question. I don't know if that allowed the state to basically set aside all zoning and... My vague uh, understanding of that was there were some agreements across different levels of government. And here you have the governor at the last minute trying to push for something just inside the state preempting. budget that the speaker of the city council, that the mayor and that local legislators here in New York City said, whoa, 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 don't rewrite the environmental rules here. Don't rewrite and take our taxes. Um, you know, there was a fierce objection right away. It's not clear that this will actually be in the final package, and it could just be, as, as Willie said, another provocation with, with Mayor DeBlasio. Well, what the city told me is that they have been in discussions for months with the state, Vornado, the MTA, uh, about, you know, different planning options around Penn Station, and this never came up, and this was new and simply surfaced this, this week. This is classic. This is classic Albany behavior, and that is that probably if they do uh, finish this budget before April 1st, it'll take at least two weeks to find out all these little secret Phillips that are in there. What is the point, if, if it is just to provoke, what's the point of that? I mean, we're not psychiatrists, <laughs> but still. I mean, it seems that uh, in general that when Governor Cuomo has picked a fight with the mayor, he's ended up on top politically. Uh, it's a place that's a sort of a comfortable place for him. So you've seen Cynthia Nixon jump into this race. He struggled to modulate how to deal with her. Uh, the default has been to attack the mayor and say she's just a stooge of the mayor and I'm going to stand with the residents of NYCHA and where is she? And then when she goes, He's raising questions about her ties to the mayor. So attacking the mayor is a very comfortable place for Andrew Cuomo. He also likes to portray himself as the great problem solver and the great executive. So here was a plan where suddenly he could step in and sort of clear everything away and come up with a, a Penn Station it plan. It has to and be said that that plan has been out there since uh, as long as I've been in the city. You know, they've been trying to figure out what to do with that area around right. Penn Station. Right, the question of what to do. Shane, speaking of figuring out what to do, how do we figure out how to cover Cynthia Nixon? She is a celebrity. Obviously, the election of Donald Trump suggests that uh, that doesn't rule her out as a candidate. But, you know, do we give her more coverage because it's interesting, because it attracts readers, because it titillates us? Uh, or at what point does she become a serious candidate who, because she might even have a chance, becomes politically viable and we ought to cover? I mean, she certainly starts in a deep poll and the early polling shows that she's far, far behind Andrew Cuomo. Um, but I think she's already established that she's a serious candidate insofar as she's built a serious campaign team with serious political people around her. And she's getting serious attention from Andrew Cuomo. Uh, just, you know, today, a whole series of labor unions in unison have been denouncing her. I don't think this is an accident. Uh, there's been a lot of non-accidents coming out of Andrew Cuomo's political, act, uh, political activity in recent weeks, uh, all signal that he's taking her seriously, which is all the more reason we should. What do you think the Working Families Party will do? I mean, this is like going to be one of the great dramas, right? Will they back her? Certainly the Working Families Party activists do not like Andrew Cuomo, but he got right. their endorsement four years ago. Fair he right. is actively working for it again right now. Um, but certainly there are a lot of elements in that party that want no part of him. What they do and whether Cuomo tries to cut off more funding from them for labor unions, uh, that's literally what's happening right now on the political side. Ideologically, if you look at where they stand and where Cuomo stands, where should they go? If you listen to Andrew Cuomo, you'd say that they should go with him. And, and he's right. He's got a progressive record of accomplishment. Um, they say he's been dragged to that record kicking and screaming. and they're the ones well, as doing, long as he got there. And they're the <laughs> ones doing the dragging. They'd rather somebody they didn't have to drag. Hmm. Um, where does Cynthia Nixon stand? I don't know yet, right? So far she's come out in this campaign, she's told us almost nothing about herself. She said a ton about Andrew Cuomo, uh, a lot of good one-liners. You know, one of the things she was asked is, what are your qualifications to that celebrity question? Her answer is, well, my chief of staff isn't headed to federal prison. Um, 
And that's a great response. It's funny. It made the tabloids. Uh, it's actually not an answer, though, to whether you're qualified to be governor. No, oh, it's a good line, a good throwaway line, but uh, not very substantive. Speaking of which, uh, Willie, is the mayor going to be headed toward uh, the witness stand in a political corruption case in Nassau County? Well, one of the lawyers for the defendants there has raised the possibility of calling the mayor as a witness. The situation there is you have uh, Harendra Singh, uh, who was a donor to the mayor, testifying as a star witness in this corruption trial in Long Island. And uh, the mayor has come out and said that Singh is a liar because Singh has uh, pled guilty to bribing the mayor through, by using campaign contributions to bribe the mayor to get some help in his contract with the city on a restaurant he owned, et cetera. So they haven't formally asked for the mayor to testify. It's not clear what would happen if they would, but it's still sort of dangling out there as a possibility. And we'll know next week, I think, uh, if he is called to testify and how he reacts. Eleanor, whatever happened to uh, ethics reform in Albany? Two words that don't seem to go together. <laughs> Oh, Sam, for goodness sake. You know, I mean, <laughs> ethics reform in Albany, it's too far away. They'll never, they'll talk about, you know, what they really do that drives me crazy is that, that if you ask one of these legislators about ethics reforms, they'll say, I voted for it. But what happens is that one house votes for one package and the other house votes for another package and they never really get together on anything. I don't, I, it, listen, if you could lose the leaders of both houses and nothing happened, you know, what, why should we? Lose them to indictments and convictions. Right. Well, well, yeah, but they're going to have to be retried. Or now subject to retrials. Yeah. Shane, uh, speaking of which, uh, we have obviously the state Senate in play uh, in November. Do you have any sense as to whether the Democrats have a real chance of retaking it? Uh, there's an interim step. There's a couple of special elections in April that the Democrats need to win, including one in Westchester. Um, but the Democrats feel pretty bullish about the idea of picking up seats in the state Senate. The question is, which Democrats and how many? Because the Democrats are split, right? There's a group that have caucused with the Republicans or sided with the Republicans. Um, there's primaries to fight among themselves. And even if they did pick up seats, would they pick up enough to offset that group should that group side with the Republicans in the future? So it's not just the numerical majority, which they could get as soon as next month. It's can they get over the leap of this group of independent Democratic senators who have been working hand in glove with the Republicans. And does it look like that independent group, so-called, is going to be threatened at all by primaries, too? Uh, they're certainly being threatened. Uh, Scott Stringer just this week is endorsing uh, some of the challengers. The challengers are organized, uh, but the party has talked about bringing them together, and that sort of stifled the momentum for those challengers. They don't have access to party resources, um, to a lot of the sort of political um, you know, infrastructure they might have otherwise hoped for. Thanks to my Times colleagues, Eleanor Randolph, Shane Goldmacher, and William Newman for joining me. And I'll have some additional thoughts on CODA. Overlooked is the title of a Times series on people we should have published obituaries about but didn't. I wondered how we would have covered the death of Jesus when it occurred. Here's one version I wrote for Vanity Fair on the eve of Easter. Jesus of Nazareth, a Galilean carpenter turned itinerant minister, whose appeals to piety and whose repute as a healer galvanized a growing contingent of believers, died on Friday after being crucified just outside Jerusalem. He was about 33. For a man who lived his first three decades in virtual obscurity, he attracted a remarkable following in only a few years. His reputation reflected a persuasive coupling of message, personal magnetism, and avowed miracles. It also resonated in the current spiritual and economic discontent and the popular resentment of privilege and authority, whether wielded by foreign overseers from Rome or by the Jewish priests in Jerusalem. Jesus had been preceded in recent years by a litany of other self-styled prophets who also promised salvation. It is arguable whether his legacy will be any more enduring. 
He seems to have been universally respected as a wise man. His appeal for mercy, humility, and compassion reverberated powerfully. But he left no written record, and he sometimes preached mixed messages. He would bless the peacemakers, but also suggested his followers buy swords. He would insist that his mission was solely to minister to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, but would also direct his devotees to proselytize to other nations. Even less is known about Jesus' youth. Because he was sometimes referred to as Mary's son, questions had been raised about his paternity. He never married, unusual for a man of his age, but not surprising for a Jew with an apocalyptic vision. His following grew as word of the miracles he performed spread before him. These miracles mirrored those performed by earlier Jewish prophets in the Hebrew Bible, although Jesus reportedly outdid his predecessors. Elijah, for example, was said to have fed a hundred people with 20 barley loaves. Jesus was credited with feeding 5,000 with five loaves. He ran afoul of the Jewish elite for blasphemy, but they lacked jurisdiction to impose capital punishment. Instead, Jesus was sentenced to death by Governor Pontius Pilate. The charge, in effect, was treason. The evidence claiming to be king of the Jews or the anointed one, Messiah in Hebrew and Aramaic, Christos in Greek. After he was declared dead on Friday night, he was buried nearby in a cave. On Sunday, his disciples reported that the body was missing. Happy Passover and Easter. For the New York Times and CUNY TV, I'm Sam Roberts.